Learning about security doesn't need to be scary. If you want to ship code securely with confidence, check out the URL below and challenge yourself with thousands of challenges in 29 coding frameworks. Let the games begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to AppSec Day. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, it's Martin from Aura Information Security, and he's going to be talking about lock picking and how to compromise physical security. So welcome, Martin. Thanks. So, hey, my eyes is really quick. Uh, I'm a principal consultant at Aura Information Security, so we, we do pen testing. We're very lock squat friendly, which is quite fortunate because uh, I like my jobs to feed into my hobbies. So, basically, it's this is just going to be on pin tumbler locks. So, pin tumbler locks are the ones that turn, that have the pins upright. Uh, most people have these on their front doors. And... The overview is that we're going to start off with the operation of these and then go into the actual concept behind lock picking. And then we're going to talk a bit more about pick resistant locks. And also tensioning is something that, that comes up quite a lot. Uh, a lot of people talk about picking, but not about tensioning and turning. And that's about 50% of it. So we'll go into there and we're not covering bypasses or destructive techniques. So this is normally this is normally like delivered as a workshop. So last night I actually had to go through and change the wording a bit. So please bear with me if it doesn't make sense, but I'll talk around that. Uh, so we're going to look at locks of varying difficulty and try and improve tensioning turning technique and learn how to deal with peak resistant locks. So they're the main goals to keep in mind. So the two golden rules of lock sport is to only pick locks that you own or have permission to pick and don't pick locks that you depend on. So only the other day someone told me, oh, I tried to pick my front door and it broke. And I'm like, remember when I told you that thing about that's why? So yeah, so remember that. Uh, it will keep you on the right side of everyone. Uh, so the, the basic tools I'm gonna talk about are sort of the standard tools that I would recommend for beginners to start with. So you've got at the top, you've got the hook and it looks like a hook and it's used for single pin picking. So single pin picking means picking each pin in the lock individually. Uh, you'll see a lot of people doing things really quickly and there'll be some people doing that today in the comp, uh, but it's actually more useful to learn about single pin picking first because then you have to actually understand what's going on rather than just a brute force sort of thing. The half diamond I've brought up because that's really useful to explore the lock. So if you think of a lock as being when you walk into a dark room and you've just come out of the daylight and you can't see anything, and then as you feel your way around and trip over and kind of look around and your eyes adjust, you start, it starts to come alive and you know where everything is. Oh, there's a lamp, there's a bed, oh, there's something else. You know, And, and that, locks are quite like that. You might get a lock and you start poking it and you'd be like, I can't feel anything. But then as you explore that lock, it sort of starts to click. It starts to make uh, different movements and you learn more about it. And then uh, last but not least is the tension bar, which is used to apply turning pressure to the core. So that'll become more relevant when you see the, the pictures that I put up and the animations. Uh, the hooks, all these come in different shapes and sizes because there's always a lock that is slightly different that needs something else. But that's the, the basic gist of it. So pin tumbler operation. Uh, I'm going to talk about just how the actual pin tumbler lock works. So that's the front of the lock. That would be what you would see on your front door or uh, on a padlock. And basically what you've got is the, the core in the middle and all the core and then the bit that turns, which is the keyway, and you can see the pin, one of the pins at the top. Um, so I normally do this workshop with a few locksmiths. Uh, they're not here today, so I'll, I'll use all kinds of terminology, but they won't get angry at me because I don't know. Uh, they usually, yeah, usually I'll be like, oh, that thing that hangs there, and they'll be, oh, yeah, that's blah, and I'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, that. But hopefully I can still explain how it works. So you've got the front and the inner bit shown here. So normally you can't see that spring. 
So at the bottom, you've got the key pin because it's closest to the key. And then you've got the blue one, which is the driver pin. So that goes up and then you've got a spring. So as you can see, there's a gap or there's a part where the, the driver pin and the key pin meet up and that's called the shear line. Or when that, when that matches up to the, to the turning bit, that's where it, uh, see there's my terminology, uh, that's when it'll turn, right? Uh, the, the whole lock will turn and open. So if you get the lock and then you turn it sideways, this is what you'll see. You'll better see, if you look inside it, you'll better see all the pins and there's springs at the top. Uh, sometimes those springs are all the same, sometimes they're a bit different, but you can see the driver pins and the key pins and the core right there. So now we've got a, an animated version of it and that's what happens when the pin goes in. So you can see that everything lines up and then it'll rotate. So from the front again, that's, that's what I've just showed you from the side. So you basically, when we're trying to pick it, uh, which I'll get onto in a minute, you're basically rinsing and repeating until all of them do that. So something that happens is if you put the wrong key in, you'll see that the key pin will go above the shear line and that'll mean that it won't turn and that's what we call overset. So if you're picking a lock and you overset it, usually you just have to stop and drag something through it to reset all the pins and start again. Uh, a lot of times that will happen to people when they're beginning and they'll be going, oh, I'm doing, I'm doing everything right, but now I've stopped being able to, to, do, to set any of the pins. Uh, and then the opposite of that is underset. So that's where you've got one pin that's too low and you can still, if you're picking it, that's actually not too bad because you can just keep going and it's probably better to have it underset a little bit until you set things. So now we've got those, those ideas of overset and underset. I can go into the concepts that we use to actually pick the lock. So this is an overhead view. So we had the sideways view before. So now we've kind of gone like this and we're looking down on the top of the lock and you can see the tops of the pins. So in a perfect world, we would have the ideal perfectly matched up, perfectly straight line of pins. Uh, but in reality, we've got very, very tiny little flaws that mean that the pins don't actually line up. So there'll be one that will be a little bit to the right, one will be a bit, little bit to the left. So when we rotate that core, one of them will have more pressure on it and that's what we call binding. So when we're lock picking, we're looking for that binding pin. It might be one or two, but it's a matter of finding that pin that's a little bit stiff when we start to turn it. And there you can see a pin binding. So as you rotate the, the core, it'll, it'll hit the side and it'll bind in it. The key with, the idea with tension later on is to make sure that it binds, but you can still move it into place. So there'll be, there'll be a certain zone within which it's too much tension or too little tension. And if you're in within the right zone, it'll, bind the pin enough to slow it down uh, or to, to, to grind against the sides, I guess, and make it set. So when I say set, it's when it lines up with the shear line. So the driver pin and the key pin line up and then it'll turn a little bit. So here we go. These would, one of these would be binding and I'm just trying to remember whether this is, oh yeah, it's animated. So it, you'll find the one that binds. It won't be necessarily in order. So it's just a matter of sitting there. And I guess a good, a good quote from a friend who got really good at this really fast is that like he just keeps trying to set the pins and eventually it just turns. So sometimes it's not a perfect art. It's, 
it's more a case of you'll set some pins, some will fall back down, you'll set a few more, and eventually they'll all be lined up and this will, it'll turn, does this turn to show? Oh, this shows the, pick, the picking. So there we've got a hook and you're coming up and you're just grazing the bottom of the key pin. And then we hit the binding one and it sets. And then you can see another one binds. So the cord turns just slightly and then another one binds. And I don't know whether this, oh, okay, so that's overset. So usually at that point, you have to go through and drag something through the, the pins and make them all reset and then start again. Okay, so normally at this time, everyone would have some picks and I'd say, let's have a go. So what we're going to do is we're going to do that later on in the workshop. And so I'll just go through what we would do. Uh, so when looking at a new lock, you get a pick and a suitable turning tool. So when I say suitable turning tool, a tool that, uh, that fits in there, doesn't ob obscure you getting a pick in there and lets you turn the core and apply tension to that. And then you get the half diamond, which is the one that's got the little triangle on it. And you would turn it upside down, as in you would have the flat part against the pins and you'll drag it through and you hear click 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 or you will feel click 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 and then you can count how many pins are in there so that's part of exploring exploring the lock and finding out what's in there so having lots of pins doesn't necessarily make it harder so you might have a lock that has has a lot of pins but is still really easy to really easy to pick so uh that comes down to tolerances, which I'll talk about as well. Um, and you only want to use enough tension to bind one pin. If you bind all the pins, then nothing, it'll make it really difficult to, to be able to set it. So normally what you would do to start off is you put some tension on the core and although some pins open counterclockwise, most of them open clockwise. So it's good to start with clockwise. All the ones that we've got in the workshop I'm pretty sure go clockwise uh, and then you gently graze each pin so uh, you put the pin in uh, the pick in and then you kind of gently graze each one and see if they're springy or binding if they're springy you just kind of leave them alone and hopefully they fall back down uh, and don't overset and if they're binding then you'll gradually graze them and you'll hear you'll <laughs> feel some sometimes you feel a click so every lock's different some locks you'll feel a click, a definite click. Some of them it'll just feel like something's stopped. It, it, it doesn't go any further. Uh, it might just feel a, a, like it might be a, a, an easier click, like not, not really a solid click. So every lock's got its own, its own character, I guess. Uh, and then if you overset a pin, you rake it. So what raking is where you drag the tool through. Um, that's also something that people use to pick locks. Uh, and you might see some of that later on. Uh, but as I said, uh, doing each pin is, a real, is probably the best way to learn. So if you've done it right, you get an open and you'll hear people kind of say open and there'll be a really satisfying uh, click or usually it'll be a different locks have diff different ways of opening. But say if you've got one of the Lockwood 334s, which is probably one of the common padlocks that you see around on building sites and that, you'll hear like, you'll feel and hear a, a shuck sort of thing. Like it'll, it'll be really satisfying. It'll be one of the best things you've ever heard before. Yeah, when you've been, when you've been sitting there with a, a lock for a good part of an hour and then it finally opens, you'll, you'll know exactly what I mean. So just to sum up and give a bit of context to this, there's a number of different picking techniques. So you've got raking, which is sliding that pick in and out. And the way that that works is it just, you're just pushing all these pins up randomly and eventually one will set or all of them will set and it'll spin round. Uh, you'll see people doing that in combination with single mean picking. So with a, a difficult lock, uh, you might want to rake it first and then there'll be a few more pins that you won't be able to set by raking and then you can just go in and, and pick them. Uh, the, a lot of, if you do a search on YouTube and you 
look for single pin picking, you'll see people just going click, 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 click and doing it all with a hook. And it's, it's sort of looked upon as being like, oh, that's the kind of cool way to, to do it. You know, you've individually set each one, although that's not always, it's not always the quickest way. Um, and then you've, oh, and then you've got uh, bumping, which is basically using uh, a key that's cut right down low and then you're hitting it with a, a hammer or a, a little, a tiny hammer and it slams in and all of the pins just pop up at the same time and when they come down, they set. So it's like a, it's like those little balls, the Newton's balls that like one will hit one and the other one will go. It's kind of like that principle. And then there's a uh, bitch picking, which is uh, kind of just damaging to, oh yeah, so when we when we did this at OzSetCon, uh I had to ask about that because I'm like, are there going to be kids there? And people were like, yes, there are, and you probably don't want to do that, but uh, I don't see any kids here today, so that's all good. Uh, so, yeah, that's just basically going in and it's quite just doing whatever you need to, to get those pins up and it's quite damaging to keyways and, and the pins. There's a guy on YouTube, I think he's in Outback Australia somewhere, and he does a lot of that because he seems to get really vocal and upset when he can't pick something. So you'll just see him if, if you look. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're looking for, for picking and you come across, there'll, there'll be one guy that you'll notice he just swears a lot and he gets really angry. And then he's like, you know, and he's swearing and everything. And he, he does a lot of that, that bitch picking where he, you know, he's just like getting really frustrated and just slams everything in. So sometimes that works. So lock positions. Uh, so locks, locks are put in all different positions. In Europe, they're usually put with the pins downwards, but in Australia, it's generally upwards. Uh, there's different ways of picking for left or right-handed. Uh, a lot of left-handed people use their thumb, but most people who are right-handed use their finger. And you've got to think of a, about the tension is like a lever, right? So if you, if you look at the end, the end moves more than the, the other bit that's, that's closer to the centre of the circle. So if you watch the bit that's further away, you'll be able to see the difference between different tension. So a longer tensioner is often easier to use because it's, you can see the difference between tension. So you might have uh, tensions when you're turning it. So you might have you know, the tension goes through here and, and say the locks here and then you might find okay here is like the sweet spot and between there is, is where you want to and the tension might be different for each pin as well uh, so some so the way that people pick uh, left-handed right-handed sometimes in a vice so uh, we haven't brought new vices today but if people come along to some of our uh, meetups we we often have uh, someone will have a vice there and so the difference between picking in your hand, picking in vice, it's just personal preference. A lot of people pick in vice because they just, they can feel things a little bit more. Um, so tensioning and turning. This is, I would say this is about 50% of the whole thing, the whole picking technique. So everyone talks about, a lot of people talk about, oh, you know, this is how I pick and, and you go under the pins and things like that. But half of it is, actually tensioning is, is actually knowing how to put enough ten, get find the right zone between which the pin will actually bind and it'll change as you pick the lock as well so it's not like you can just have a, t a set tension and then pick your lock which may work in some cases but generally each pin has got slightly different tension because you think about you're holding all these other pins up like you're holding you're turning it so that a number of pins, like maybe three of the pins are staying up and then you're still trying to set the other one. So you're trying to, and remember what I was saying about binding, we we're saying that we had to have enough tension to bind, let it bind, but also let it move. So think about that while you're also holding the other pins in place. So obviously these pins fall down randomly and you've got to reset them and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, the most common way of tensioning a lock is bottom of keyway. So as you can see there, we've got a, an, a standard, fairly standard keyway 
and there's a, a bent piece of metal that goes in the bottom and then they're, you know, the person's turning it. So often you'll see someone holding a, a padlock or a, or a euro lock like that and then they'll be pushing like this. Hopefully people can see that. Uh, and then it stays, uh, the benefits are that it stays in the lock a little bit easier. Uh, it works to bind, the, it can bind the core sometimes, so that's a negative. Uh, so if the bottom of it there, if it scrapes along the edge of the, the cavity that the core's in, then you might find that it affects your ability to feel the binding of the pins. So anything that, so you've got this thing, this core turning inside, a cylinder and you want to be able to feel just the pins. So anything else that is disrupting that is going to make it a bit more confusing. That includes springs. So some, some lock cores have springs that will turn it the other way and you kind of have to fight against the spring as well as, as the actual turning. So a good example of that would be an American lock. So we've got an American lock in there in one of the comps and we'll probably talk about it when someone's, when someone's picking that. Uh, you get a little bit less room for picking with bottom of the keyway because, as you see, it takes up the bottom. And so usually I try and use the short one so it's easy to get under and get under the pins and pick the pins further in. Slightly easier to hold for right-handers as well. And then you've got... Did I just talk about that with the wrong? No, I've got the right one. Um, so oh, there's, I continue on with this. It stays in the lock easier. Uh, oh yeah, so longer uh, bottom of keyway can be used for precise visual tensioning as well. So that's basically what I talked about before. If it's a longer tensioning thing, you can see more at the end of it, at the extreme end of it. So then we've, got, we've also got top of keyway. So top of keyway gives you a whole lot more space at the bottom and so you're less likely to hit other pins when you go in and underneath the pins. So some of the things that I'm, I'm talking about are things that I've also overheard when I've been at DEF CON and someone who's really, really good at picking like uh, Deviant, you know, are talking and, and he used to talk about going under the pin and then setting the pins on the other side of it as well. Uh, so it's not, just, just, it's probably part of just being aware that, you know, you might have set some pins in the middle of the lock and then you need to get the ones at the other end seem to be the ones binding so you have to go underneath them and and go up and sometimes you can kind of imagine a lot of it's like visualizing it in your mind whether would I be able to even reach that pin do I need a, a different kind of pick uh, there's slightly better feedback with the top of keyway because they're usually thicker I don't personally I don't really like the ones that flex uh, I like to be able to really feel, uh, you know, when, it, when anything's binding. Uh, it can slightly bind the front pin. So instead of grinding on the side of the cylinder, it actually can bind the top pin because when you push it in, it can rub on the, the front of it. So that's one of the side effects of that. You'll see a lot of people using those in comps, though. Okay, so uh, tensioning and turning technique. So we're looking to find that turning pressure zone that binds a pin but allows movement, keeps a pin set, uh, and lets you also move the other more, more pins. So you might be like, okay, the tension for the first pin's like kind of here, oh yeah, set. And then you be like, oh, I need to have it a bit tighter because a bit harder because I need to hold that one up and bind the other one, but I have to have it a little bit less so that the pins still move. Uh, and finding that, it lets, it, you, you really want to make sure that you can set those other pins as well. So if you, you might bind it up and then be rip, people get really worried that all the other pins are going to fall down. And so they, they keep a lot of tension on it. You know, and, and also your hand will get really sore, uh, which goes away after a while. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you have a few sessions of doing that for a few hours and, and you'll build up those muscles pretty quick. But, uh, yeah. It, it's it's something that uh, I guess a lot of people will bind it right up because they're worried about them falling down. And so like, probably don't worry about that. Just make sure that you can still move the other pins because you can always reset the ones that drop down. So when would you use higher turning pressure? 
You would use high turning pressure when you've got tighter tolerances. Tolerances are essentially uh, how accurately something has been made. So uh, think about a sloppy lock where everything moves around. You're about to tell the difference between something binding and something not binding. There'll be a lot of movement when as soon as you set one, it'll turn a lot more. But when it's really well, uh, when it's precision made, you'll find that that'll be a lot finer, finer, and there'll be a lot more, uh, a lot less difference between in between the too much tension and not enough tension. So uh, the other thing that changes it is the spring loaded cords that I was talking about before. So you've got the American one one o five. And I would encourage everyone to have a go at that. Uh, come up to me if you... Oh, actually, that's one of the comp ones. So I encourage everyone to go in the comp. Uh, Beck will explain about we're a bit limited with tensioners at the moment. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, release pressure until there's pin movement. So generally, like, I'll start with binding it up quite a lot and then just back it off a little bit until until everything starts to move but not so that everything just moves too much. So this brings us to peak re resistant locks. Uh, so peak resistant locks are locks that are designed to make picking harder. One of the things about lock sport is that a lot of physical security is security by obscurity. And I think most people here would understand that that's not really real security. If you know how something works, it should still be fairly secure or fairly strong uh, if it's implemented correctly. So a lot of locks are very easy to pick, but the person installing it might not tell you that. So you'll have a false sense of security and install a lock that can be really easy to pick. So coming back to pick resistant locks, uh, tolerance. Tolerance relates to how tightly the parts fit together. A closer tolerance makes the lock harder to pick because there's less movement and it's much finer, but it's much more satisfying. So once you do, there'll be some master locks there. So once you pick master locks, you're like, oh, wow. And it's not uncommon for people to say, oh, I can pick all these locks. And then someone, someone will say, yeah, try this one. So that happens a lot to me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in, in our team, we've, we've got, uh, we're quite a lot, as I said, we're quite a lock sport friendly uh, team and there was one of the guys, Greg, he, uh, I remember he was picking like the basic master locks about 12 months ago and then he came third in the OzSetCon competition and I've given him locks that I can't pick and he'll just be like, oh, that worked really easily. And I'm like, ha! Ah. So, yeah, but sometimes I think that's a psychological thing. Uh, so the thing that makes locks harder is... Uh, Another thing that makes locks harder is the number of pins. So as I said, there's that caveat that if it's a really loose lock and it's got lots of pins, it might still be really easy to rake. But generally uh, with, a, with good tolerance, like a tight tolerance, more pins mean there's more pins to accidentally overset or underset. So it's just a mathematical thing. Security pins. So I'll show some pictures in a moment. But weird shapes get stuck at different points and feel different. So that's the general gist of that. Like, if you have something that's a certain uniform shape, it's quite predictable. They're all the same. But if someone starts putting different shapes in there then it, and they're not all the same, then it gets a little bit different. Um, the keyway. So keyways are, makes it really tricky. So there's some situations where you actually have to use a different pick to be able to get in there. Uh, I'll have a few examples of that as well. And the bidding. So the bidding is something that you probably want to talk to Erebuff Overflow because she's very good at uh, impressioning. And it, when you're impressioning, that that really, yeah, that really, uh, that makes a big difference. So you can go and see it. We've got some keys as well, and you can go and have a look at those as well. And the spring strength. So if the springs are all different, that makes it quite confusing. And then if you've got springs that actually fight against you turning it, you need to account for that as well. So it just increases the, the variables. Okay, so uh, when I was talking about number of pins, to count the pins, as I said before, you insert a half diamond pick 
and you slowly remove it and you let the pin snap down and then you can count the pin. So this is the first thing that you should do on any lock that you're about to pick. So security pins that I mentioned earlier. So this is a mushroom pin and on the right is a standard pin. So you can see the standard pin is pretty straightforward. It'll go up and down and then when it hits the top, it, when it hits the edges, uh, when, when the edges hit the cylinder, it'll just sort of snap into place. But if you're doing that with the mushroom pin, you have a few more things that you encounter. So when it hits that ridge, we get what's called a false set, which I, I don't think we've, oh, okay. So I've got a 3D printed model that will demonstrate that really well. And I can show people later on in the log spot room. So we've got mushroom pin, we've got uh, a serrated pin and a beveled spool. So the serrated one is the one with lots of grooves. And so that will kind of catch on every single one. So the key to doing that, uh, to bypassing that or to pick that is to set it a little bit, like be aware of it. You'll, you'll kind of feel it go click, 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 click. Um, it might just be a bit of a rougher feel and it's really experienced with that, but you will sort of nudge it very ever, ever so gently and it'll go up one and then you try and set some of the other pins and then you come back to it and then you set it a little bit more and eventually that'll set properly and you can keep going. So with the, the one on the right, you'll get a false set. So with the false set, it'll, it'll end up kind of coming in on an angle and you'll have to let it counter rotate. So rotate the other way. So if, it, if you're picking clockwise and then you have to go, you have to let it, let the tension up a little bit more. So obviously if you've got a few pins set, it gets quite complicated, but you know, generally it's a feel thing. Uh, there's another one. Uh, oh, okay, here we go. Here's a picture of a spool pin. And the next slide will show it binding. There you go. So that's what will give you that false set. So when you push up, it'll get caught on that ridge and it'll feel different from a normal set. And there'll be a lot of, a lot of rotation. Oh, there'll be more rotation than you would normally get when you set a pin. So it'll be slightly different to the other pins. Unless they're all... When, when they're actually all spool pins, it actually ma it makes it quite a bit hard, it makes it quite a bit easier because everything moves around. So you'll find that a lot of locks will have a combination of spool pins and standard pins because that makes it, uh, makes it stay in place a bit. And you have to set the normal pins in order to better feel that kind of, that kind of uh, false set. So as you see, it's going up and false set then you let it kind of rotate and it keeps going. So it's like, if you're right-handed, you kind of let your finger up just a little bit and it'll <laughs> click into a set. You'd be like, yes, I'm, I'm on my way. You, know, you often hear people saying, oh, I've got a good false set here because it means they're, they're almost there. They're almost, uh, they've almost picked it. So to successfully set it, we let the core kind of rotate slightly and it goes through, there you go. So serrated pins are easy to overset because it's easy to just push them too far and then they won't set. Uh, you want to set a single serration and then check the other pins and then you go back and set another serration, keep going. feels different to a real set. If overset, you just rake it through and restart is, is the only answer, I suppose, to that. Uh, so we've got tolerance here. All right, keyway. So that's your standard C4 keyway. Uh, and normally what you would need to do is when you get to, that's probably not too hard. So you could probably pick off that little ledge on the left-hand side there. So that would be on, say, probably an A-bus. Beck, would that be an A-bus? No, that looks like a Lockwood. Yeah, okay, that'd be a Lockwood. Um, and this is... This is actually quite a difficult lot to, yeah. So, uh, but it's a really good example of a, a real difficult keyway as well. I'm pretty sure that this has got uh, gates on either side. So if you hit any of those, then you have to start again. Some of them actually lock up the, the, the lock as well. But usually with different shaped picks and turning tools, we can overcome uh, 
different difficult key ways. Okay, so key bidding. Using different shape picks, uh, we can o overcome these, these key ways. Um, but this is, this is an example of a fairly extreme bitting. So when we say bitting, it's the way that the pins will need to be arranged in order to open the lock. So if you look at that key there, the innermost pin will or well, the furthest pin away from the, key, the uh, opening will have to be pushed up really high. And so you'd have to pick underneath that big one that goes down. So that makes it quite hard. So the, the difference between them, there's actually limits in normal locks, which makes them easier to pick, which is because otherwise, if, if, you, have, if you have like two extreme uh, bitting, then it actually makes it hard to pull the, uh, the uh, key in, in, in and out. So when you see people impressioning, sometimes the key will actually get stuck when you, when you have to do that. So I, I remember doing that and then looking at the book and going, oh, that means I'm doing the right thing if it's, yeah, same with snapping. Uh, if anyone wants to know more about uh, impressioning, which is basically putting a blank in there and twisting it around and then uh, making a working key, uh, Go and, go and talk to air buff overflow. Uh, okay, so spring strength. Uh, oh, this is, this is the first uh, cutaway that I made at OzSecCon uh, this, this year. Uh, so I, was, I thought I'd just put a picture of that because I was quite pleased with that. So that involves actually taking the lock apart and cutting it all these bits and having the lock still work. So the more you cut away a lock, the less likely it is to work properly. But that shows some uh, interesting pins there. You can see, I think there's a serrated and there's a couple of spool pins as well. Um, and it's also got different pin strengths as well. So in the cutaway, you can see that the springs are compressed at different amounts. So it changes the feeling for binding and uh, it feels different as you progress. So, so you'll need diff a lot of different tension on that. Okay, so troubleshooting. Um, this is what happens when you're trying to pick a lock and you turn around and go, oh, I can't pick it. What do we do? So if you can't feel the binding or setting, the pins may be overset, so they may be up too much and then you can't actually bind another pin because one of them's overset. You may be unsetting a set pin, so go under, underneath it with a hooked diamond uh, is a good example. There's all different types of shapes that you can look up on the internet, but that's what a hooked diamond looks like. The turning pressure may be too high or too low. So as I said you'll, before, you'll find like the range between which it's like the kind of sweet spot and then you can oscillate between that for each pin. And you might need to just use a thinner or lighter pick for more feeling. Uh, and, you know, I guess with that, it's quite easy to start relying on lighter picks because you can feel more but then sometimes you do actually need a more robust pick for some some locks that are a little bit more troublesome okay so uh basically this is what you need to uh probably get started uh i i'd advise you to ask lots of questions there's no real dumb questions please ask ask us lots of questions in the workshop uh and also talk to me if you're a web app person that picks locks because uh, I've got headcount in my team. Uh, so we are looking for, always looking for good people and we have a really friendly team and everyone shares and that. So I'll now introduce Erbof Erfluf to talk about tool. Hi everyone, um, I'm Era Buffer Overflow. Uh, if that's too much of a mouthful, you can just call me Buffy or Beck. Um, I am one of the co-founders of Tool Australia. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Tool, they're basically a worldwide organization um, for lock sport enthusiasts. Um, don't be fooled by the name. We don't do just lock picking. We also do impressioning. Um, if we have the hands available, safe cracking, things like that. 
We're open to all skill levels, um, but if you are interested in finding out how to break into people's homes or using your skills for illegal purposes, um, please don't come along. We're not interested in teaching you those skills. Um, this is a hobby um, and something that should be practiced responsibly. We have chapters in Melbourne, Newcastle and Canberra. Um, if you're from interstate, so Sydney, Adelaide, Perth, Tasmania, Queensland, Darwin, or am I missing one? I don't think so. I think I am missing one. I'm missing one of the territories. You did Tasmania? Yeah, I did Tasmania. Anyway, if you're from any of the states or territories that I didn't list, um, we are always looking for people to start meetups. Um, the process is pretty simple. You basically just need to get a bunch of people together for regular meetups um, and then you can become an affiliated chapter. Um, that just basically means that we will help you as much as possible run your meetups by giving you an audience, managing um, the day-to-day -day operations, so listing events and things like that. Um, so if you are interested in something like that, please feel free to come and talk to me. Um, if you're interested in membership, we have three different levels. Um, the normal one is a $10 yearly membership, um, and that grants you access to everything um, that any tool member gets. Um, so that can be things like private meetups, um, you get a fancy little card, stickers, um, and things like that. We're also hoping to run some workshops throughout the year. Um, if you're a member of ALG on Facebook, you can get a discounted membership for $7. Um, you basically get the exact same things. Um, we just want to acknowledge the partnership that we have with them. Um, and finally, if you're a member of Tool Overseas, so that's in the Netherlands, the US, UK, or I believe Norway, um, you get a $5 membership. Um, and that's the same sort of deal. Basically get everything. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to come and chat to me um, in the lock picking room. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions about tool or impressioning. Please don't ask me questions about lock picking because I'm awful at it. Um, that is obviously Martin's territory. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh. Right. So just about the workshop, we do have very limited space. Um, this is due to a very sh small number of tension wrenches, um, but we have lots of picks. So if you're willing to work with someone or have a friend in the room, please feel free to bring them in. Um, basically, it will be limited to the number of tools per person that we have, uh, tools per people. Um, we do also have a small competition running. Um, there's a basically a qualifying round, a second round, and then a finals. Um, we've basically given priority of tooling to the people who want to compete. Um, there will be a prize at the end, um, but we'll cover that off a bit more in the other room. So that doesn't start until 2.30, so you have 15 minutes to line up. Please don't go into the room. Um, we need to finish setting up in there. Um, yeah, is that everything? Okay, I believe that's everything, so you're free to go now. <laughs>